1 John chapter 1, verse 8. If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. My little children, I'm writing you these things so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He himself is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for those of the whole world. This is how we know that we know him, if we keep his commands. The one who says, I've come to know him, and yet doesn't keep his commands, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly in him, the love of God is made complete. This is how we know we are in him. The one who says he remains in him should walk just as he walked. Dear friends, I'm not writing you a new command, but an old command that you've had from the beginning. The old command is the word you have heard. Yet I am writing you a new command, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I'll inside your newsletters, there's a sermon outline there. There's some questions up on the top right. Uh, If you have any questions after the sermon, uh, there'll be a brief question time or you can bring your questions tonight and that's how we kick off the summer study series each week with questions that might have come out of the sermon. Uh, We're spending January reminding ourselves of the good life, how good it is to be one of God's people. Uh, In the first passage we looked at, Colossians 3, 1 to 4, we saw the goodness of having our lives hidden with Christ, that in him our sins are forgiven and then we're given all of his perfection. We receive that by trusting in Jesus, what he's done and who he is and the Bible calls that justification. In the second passage, the one that Phil helped us look at, Colossians 3, 1 to 11, we saw the goodness of battling sin. And that's one of the themes that runs through all of the good life. The good life is to grasp hold of Jesus, to be changed by him, to be changed in him, having all of his perfection and living like it. Uh, Last week in Colossians 3, 12 to 17, we saw the goodness of sanctification, holy and dearly loved. God's people are already holy fit for God's use, and then they spend the rest of their lives getting used to it. And they do that in community, forgiving each other and bearing with each other. Now, I just want to go on a brief tangent. I don't often do this, but I'm reading a corker book, The Yearling. I don't know if you've ever read The Yearling, but it's terrific. Uh, Parents, buy a copy, read it to your kids. But I was struck two nights ago by this description of living in community together. This isn't a Christian book, but it captures that. A family have gathered together because they've lost their youngest child. The talk broke over Penny in a torrent. The relief of words washed and cleansed the hurt that had been ingrown. Penny listened gravely, nodding his head from time to time. He was a small, staunch rock against which their grief might beat. When they finished and fell quiet, Penny talked of his own loss. It was a reminder that no man was spared. Here it is. What all had borne, each could bear. He shared their sorrow. They became a part of his sorrow. And the sharing spread their grief a little by thinning it. Isn't that a great description of community? A community that shares in forgiveness because of grace, that description of a community we saw last week, a community of sanctification. Well, this week, as we look at 1 John, we're going to explore the goodness of facing our sins, of confronting sin in our lives and how good that can be. Let me pray and let's dive into it together. Let's pray. Father, thanks for your word. Thank you that is living and active. It's beating with life. It brings life, it moulds life, it changes lives. 
Father, thank you that your word is open to any person, but it leaves no person unchanged by your spirit. Father, please don't let us be unchanged this morning. As we listen to these words about the reality of sin, confronting sin, the goodness of forgiveness, please change us by your spirit as a community of individuals, holy and dearly loved. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, over the last few weeks, we've spent time in Colossians, and this week we're turning to 1 John, uh, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, John's biography of Jesus and the book of Revelation are all written by, yep, you guessed it, John, uh, one of Jesus' disciples. Uh, John wrote 1 John to help his readers, who are God's mob, to understand what fellowship with God and Jesus and each other might look like. And then to hop into that most fully. If you've got your Bibles there, listen to 1 John chapter 1, verse 3. What we have seen and heard, we also declare to you, so that you also may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father, with his Son, Jesus Christ. We're writing these things so that our joy may be complete. It's another way of saying your life is hidden with Christ Therefore, live as you are. Your life is hidden with Christ. Therefore, live as you are. Those phrases we've looked at over the last few weeks. Uh, The beating heart of this community, this fellowship, is there in verse 5. Look at verse 5. This is the message we've heard from him and declare to you. God is light. There is absolutely no darkness in him. Growing up as a minister's kid, One of the great fears that I would have when I was a young child was that at about 8 o'clock at night, Dad might ask me to go and get something from the church. I knew what was in that church. It was big and it was really dark. Uh, There was an eagle up the front where the Bible was held. That was scary enough. Uh, There were big windows and alcoves and there was an eerie kind of darkness about it. When we lived in Maroubra, one of the worst things was that the light switch was on the other side of the building to the door. And so you had to just run on your tippy toes to go and turn that light off so there was no darkness in the building. We know that light and dark don't mix, don't we? (laughs) We know that light and dark do not and cannot mix. The imagery that he uses there in verse 5 is very clear to us. To live with God means that you're in line with God's character and nature. Light and dark do not mix. It's an imagery that's right throughout whatever John writes. In terms of what we've been talking about from Colossians, if you are in fellowship with God, if your life is hidden with Christ, then you're forgiven of your sins. You've got all of Jesus' perfection. You must live as you are. Put off, put on. Light and dark do not mix. And John then unpacks this in a series of if statements. Uh, Did you see that there in verses 5 to 8? Each verse begins with an if. Verse 6, if. Verse 7, if. Verse 8, if. Verse 9, if. Verse 10, if. They're the logical consequences. If this is true, then this. Now The first is there in verses 6 to 7. If we say we have fellowship with him and yet we walk in the darkness, we're lying not practising the truth. If we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus his son cleanses us from all sin. If you say your life is hidden with Christ, you walk different. You walk different. Who's God? Not you. God is God. If you are in fellowship with God, if you've been transferred out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, if you have been given all of Jesus' perfection, then live like it. Stop mucking around with sin. Stop dabbling in sin. Stop dipping your pinky into sin. Stop immersing yourself in sin. Stop living in sin. 
if you have all of Jesus' perfection. Now, I think that's reasonably clear. But sometimes it can be misunderstood, can't it? And there's a history of people misunderstanding this throughout the community of God's people. So John then confronts that in verses 8 to 10. I'm at point 2 on the outline. Look at verse 8. If we say we have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves. The truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we've not sinned, we make him a liar. His word is not in us. Remember, John's writing to God's mob so they understand what fellowship with each other and with God and his son looks like. He's writing to Christians and he wants to make sure that God's mob deal in reality. When God says that his people have all of Jesus' perfection now by faith, he is not saying that now in this day and age you will live with perfect behaviour every day of the week. I love this about God's word. It deals with reality. (laughs) Sin is part of our real struggle and battle to live as we are. It's a constant factor in our lives. God recognises that. He recognises that truth, which is why he continually exhorts his people to put it off. He recognises that truth as he continually reminds his people of the danger of sin. God recognises this truth as he points out people who lead God's people astray and away from the truth. Remember Jude? God knows this truth as he exposes false teachers. As we live as we are, we will battle what? We'll battle sin. That is reality. And so isn't verse 9 so good? Look there at verse 9 with me. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That if there assumes what's just been said. God's people are struggling with sin. As they live as they are, they will stumble into sin. They will sin. And what's the great goodness? A sin committed is a sin that can be forgiven. Any sin committed is a sin that can be forgiven. And did you see how John laid out a very clear goodness there in verse 9? The reality of sins recognised. The wrongness of sin is confessed to God through Jesus. The forgiveness of God is swift, efficient, sufficient, complete and cleansing. Sins committed can be sins forgiven. And in that little verse, four truths are unpacked to help us remember this. Sin is committed firstly against God. That's why it's sin. Remember our definition of sin? Uh, We we know it ad nauseum, don't we? Sin is the attitude and action that says, I am God and God is not. Sin is committed against God. Secondly, that means sin must be dealt with by coming to who? To God. To God. A sin will involve other people. Sin will involve the things of this world and they must be dealt with. But sin must first, primarily, principally be dealt with by coming to who? Come to God. Sin must be confessed, thirdly. Sin must be brought before God. Recognise for what it is, a desire to sit on God's throne instead of God, laid before him and asking him to forgive it. And when God receives that, what is God fourthly? God is sufficiently faithful. God is sufficiently truthful. God is sufficiently straight up and down that he will do as he has always promised. I forgive you as far as east is from the west. Remember Psalm 103, which we just said? As far as east is from the west, that sin is forgiven and removed. So as we live as God's people, here are two good truths about the good life. The first sounds a little funny, but it's still a good truth. Sin is real. 
Sin is real in the life of the person who is holy and dearly loved. God himself says so. Jesus recognises us so and John reminds us so. So please don't underplay the significance of sin. It is a very real danger, a very real threat, a very real temptation to go and sit back on God's throne. But on the other hand, please don't make sin so big that you think God can't deal with it. (laughs) Do you notice that there are no sub-clauses or footnotes with that verse? If we bring our sin to God, what will God do? He'll forgive it. And we'll come to that in a moment. That's the first good truth. The second, sin can be forgiven. All sin can be forgiven. We're called to struggle against sin, aren't we? We're called to put it off. We're called to run from it. And when we don't, we have this reassurance from God, come to me and I will forgive you. No provisos, no KPIs, no limit, only sins this big, not this big. No statement about the frequency. God states that if we confess our sins to him, what will he do? He'll forgive it. He'll cleanse us. Two good truths. Now, John's realistic about sin. We know that. We've just said that a couple of times. He's also got a realistic approach to sin and God's people. I'm at point three on the outline. Look at verse one of chapter two. My little children, I'm writing you these things so that you may not sin, but if anyone does sin, We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He himself is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, not only for ours, but also for those of the whole world. We're familiar with those words, aren't we? We we use them often in our services. We use them at the time of group confession and assurance. We often love verse 2, don't we? But do you notice why John is writing these words in verse 1? My little children, I'm writing you these things so that you may not sin. So that you may not sin. John writes these words to God's mob who are in fellowship with God and Jesus and with each other, whose lives are hidden with Christ, to those who are to live as you are, so they may not sin. John's reasonable and godly desire is for God's people to confront sin and to run away from it, to avoid it, to be holy and dearly loved in every moment of their lives. Sin is to be confronted and run away from. Sin is to be confronted and taken off. Sin is to be confronted and replaced by kindness and patience and gentleness and self-control. It is good and necessary to confront sin and stop sinning. And John's already given us one very clear reason for this in verse 5, hasn't he? Light and dark don't mix. (laughs) Light and dark don't mix. He's also given us that incredible reassurance in verse 9 of what happens when we do sin. He does it again in verse 2. Did you see that? If anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He himself is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, the propitiation, not only for ours, but also for those of the whole world. Do you you notice the really wise and godly and gentle balance here? Confront sin, don't sin, get rid of sin. When you sin, confess and be forgiven. Confront sin, don't sin, get rid of sin. And when you stumble... Come to your Father and you'll be forgiven because we have an advocate. We have someone, as Jade pointed out, who speaks up for us. In fact, do you know that in the New Testament, I didn't know this until this week, John is the only person in the whole of the New Testament who uses that word for Jesus. It's there in John's Gospel and it's there in 1 John. Jesus is the best lawyer you never knew you needed. 
He'll stand up in the eternal law court of God and say, that person's sins are forgiven. They have all of my perfection. I speak for them. Remember a few weeks ago, maybe a few months ago, we had a kids talk about propitiation. Uh, we all call it in hands that look like that because propitiation is a big word. And propitiation means that he stood in for us. Jesus stood in for us. He took our judgment. He paid it sufficiently for the anger of God to be turned away. In fact, it is so sufficient, so efficient, that it will restore at one point the whole universe. Did you see that at the end of verse 2? It's sufficient to restore everything in the world. Confront sin. Don't sin. Get rid of sin. And when you do sin, you have an advocate with the Father. But there's another reason to confront sin. Uh, It's there in verses 3 to 6. This is how we know that we know him if we keep his commands. The one who says, I've come to know him and yet doesn't keep his commands is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly in him the love of God is made complete. This is how we know we are in him. The one who says he remains in him should walk just as he walked. Now let me be very clear as we dive into this second reason. This is talking about a whole of life attitude. So if you are someone who says, I know Jesus... You are someone who obeys Jesus, who listens to his commands, puts off and puts on. I want you just to think about that. If you say that you know Jesus, you are someone who obeys Jesus. I want you to think about how that combines grace and obedience perfectly. Remember last week that we described life as God's people as living as you are? Remember that we described the community that came out of that as a community of people living as you are, as a community that had one concept at its heart. It was the concept of grace. Living as people who've received God's undeserved love and forgiveness. And that same grace is here in these verses. Did you see the very clear order in verse 3? If I obey Jesus, I know him. Is that what it says? No. It starts with grace, doesn't it? This is how we know that we know him. The knowing Jesus comes first. That's grace. God has sent Jesus to find us, live for us, die for us and rise for us. That transfers us, that hides our lives by faith with him. That means that we know him. And so we obey him, live as we are. If you know Jesus, you obey him. If your life is hidden with Jesus, you live like Jesus. If you are holy and dearly loved, live as you are. Do you notice that grace and obedience aren't opposites? Grace and obedience aren't enemies. Grace and obedience aren't two different ways to approach God. Now, they're, they're so intertwined. We're made God's people by his grace in Jesus. We know him. He knows us. And then that is displayed by obeying Jesus. He unpacks it further in verse 4. He unpacks it further in verse 4. The one who says, I've come to know him, and yet doesn't keep his commands is a liar. The truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly in him, the love of God is made complete. That's how we know we're in him. The one who says he remains in him shall walk just as he walked. To to know Jesus and not obey him, you're a liar. You're a liar. And do you notice that's the same language as chapter 1, verses 8 and 10? Exactly the same language. So he's not ignoring the reality that you'll battle with sin. He's just saying, if your whole life is captured by going around trumpeting that you know Jesus, but you never obey him, 
You're never being changed by him. Remember Colossians 3 verse 10. You're a liar. And to seek to obey Jesus by God's help, Colossians 3.10, is nothing more than the end point of God's love. It's to understand what love is from God, the love that lives, dies, and rises for you, the love that transfers you from the domain of darkness into the kingdom of life, the love that grabs your life and hides it in Jesus, the love that's already made you holy, the love that is displayed as completely changing you, the love that has an advocate who speaks up for you. And so you walk in every same step of Jesus. Did you pick that up from Pat's last reading in the Great Commission? Go and make disciples by teaching them everything I've instructed you and to obey it. To be a disciple of Jesus is to display that you know him by obeying him. There's nothing new here. Look at verse 7. Dear friends, I'm not writing you a new command but an old command that you've had from the beginning. The old command is the word that you've heard. Nothing different to what God said to Adam and Eve in the garden. Here's the whole universe. There's grace. Just don't eat from that tree. That's obedience. Abraham, I choose you as an idol-worshipping Babylonian to be the start of the salvation of the universe. Go into that land. There's grace and there's obedience. All of Israel gathered at Mount Sinai as God has already saved them out of Egypt. There's grace. Obey me so that you represent me to the universe. There's obedience. It's an old command. Grace and obedience. But it's a new command. Look at verse 8. Yet I'm writing you a new command which is true in him and in you because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. That's why we had the first reading from Matthew because Jesus says, I haven't come to get rid of that old command. I've actually come to fulfill it. (laughs) It's true in him. It's true in him. And he is the perfect mix of grace and obedience. In him there is no darkness. In him knowing God is expressed in perfect obedience of God and that is now given to you, so live like it. The relationship between grace and obedience is good. That's the third truth from today. The relationship between grace and obedience is the good life, publicly constantly and daily. So let me finish by reminding you of the three truths. Sin is real in the life of the person whose life is hidden with Christ. Secondly, sin can be forgiven, all of sin. Thirdly, sin must be confronted because grace and obedience go hand in hand. They're our three truths of the good life. So what might that look like tomorrow morning? Remember we're talking about that? What does it look like on Monday morning? Let me make three very simple suggestions before I pray. First, don't ignore, don't minimise, don't dismiss the reality of sin as God's people. Sin is real and we're told to put it off. Secondly, don't so maximise sin that we minimise forgiveness. That we say, oh, God can't forgive that sin. It's not even possible for God to forgive that sin. No, no. Jesus can and will advocate for you over any sin and the forgiveness will be complete. Thirdly, please confront sin. Not because you want to be good, not because of pride in some moral code, but because you've received grace and know Jesus. And you display that by obeying his instruction. Sin is best confronted when grace is seen in obedience. Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. Uh, John certainly doesn't write in a simple way, Father, uh, and he has laid a lot before us today, but these three simple truths have come out. Father, thank you that you remind us of the reality of sin.
Father, thank you that you promise to forgive any sin brought before you because Jesus is our advocate. And Father, thank you that you command your people to run from sin, to confront sin, to avoid sin. Thank you that this is the obedience of the one who has already saved us. Please help us to enjoy this grace by obeying our Saviour. Amen. Any questions? Baxter and then Elsie. Yeah, Baxter, is a really good question. How do we know that if we know we shouldn't sin, we keep sinning, and we go before God and confess that we aren't using his forgiveness as a blank check? Uh, That's a big answer, which we'll chat about later on. I reckon the first point of call is I'm always concerned when people tell me they aren't battling sin. That's the first alarm bell. So if you are aware of sin and you're battling it and you're continually confessing it before God, asking him for his forgiveness, that's a good sign because you're doing exactly what John writes. But if you're someone who walks around saying, oh, no, Jesus, and then off you go, then you're a liar because you're doing exactly what John wrote. (laughs) So do you see the slight difference? So the battle against sin the struggling with sin, the confessing of sin is a reminder that you are aware of the sin and the reality and bringing it to God in confession. Does that give you a bit of a hand? Terrific. That's a thumbs up. Over here to Elsie. Um, you said earlier that God will help us to see and move life. And you said that God Yep. All right, how does God help us to see who are the right teachers? Is that the question? Yeah, terrific. What have we all got in our hands? A Bible. What have I asked you to continually look at throughout the sermon? The Bible, okay? So you want your teachers to be people who faithfully express what is written in God's word. And when they don't, what are you to do? Ask questions and put your hand up, okay? And so that's the key area for faithful teaching. Always be worried about innovators with God's word, okay? Always be worried about that. But God's word as the basis for understanding. Now, are there some areas there where there'll be? There there are some areas where people will have disagreements, but always come back to what God's word says. Yeah, does that answer your question a bit else? Terrific. Lloyd? Um. So is repentance a product of a relationship with Christ or a prerequisite of a relationship with Christ? Let me ask uh, everyone, what are you in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 and 2? What are you? Dead. Dead in your what? Sins. Can a dead person do anything? No. So for you to actually come to God, what must happen first? God must come to you and work in you. And we're told in the Bible that God works in us by his spirit, draws us to himself so that we know what it means. And then verse 4, because of his love, he transforms us as he transfers us. Then that leads to a life of repentance. And so I think both are operating. Uh, God works the repentance necessary for you to come back to him. God works. Uh, Same in Philippians chapter 2, verses uh, 11 to 13. And then once God has worked that in you, live as you are as a repentant person. 